So uh, my name is Zenia Dormosh. I am an adult and pediatric neurosurgeon. I work at the Royal Adelaide, the Children's Hospital here in Adelaide, um, as well as the Memorial Hospital. What first sparked your interest in medicine? Um, well, I've always really enjoyed biology. Um, as a child and going through school, I did it all the way up until year 12. Um, and it was something that was suggested to me by, by a biology teacher. Before that, you know, I've always thought, oh, medicine is like, you know, being a doctor is like one of those things that smart people do. Um, so, yeah, she, um, so that was back in year 11 and year 12, and she really kind of, you know, encouraged me to um, consider it as a career. Oh, lovely. What made you decide to pursue neurosurgery as a career? Right, so initially, um, of course, it was just the idea of it, you know, like, oh, to be a brain surgeon, why not? Um, but the biggest part of it was really because I wanted to prove my grandfather wrong. <laughs> He um, he has this thing with um, uh, he's very old fashioned. Um, in it's my mom's side of the family, so I have an Asian grandfather, and he very much has this idea that you know um, women um, you don't need to um, put in too much effort into a female education. Very much of that generation still, and whereas my mom really you know wanted us to um, to have you know big dreams and um, reach you know at whatever and basically aim for whatever we want to do. Um, and so initially it was, you know, why, why is my mom investing in me doing, um, doing medicine? And then uh, my grandfather's like, you know, that's, that's a waste of money, all these things. Um, and then when I started medicine, um, I was like, well, then I want to be a neurosurgeon and um, prove him wrong. And, but then I looked more into it and I got really interested in, um, in neurosurgery. I love the technical aspects of it. Um, I love how, you know, day to day what we do changes from something really you know, very elective and very much planned um, to, you know, something happens, you get a call from emergency and your whole day is just upended and you change um, gear and, you know, do something that's emergency and completely different. So that really interests me. Excellent. Um, how many years did it take you to train to become a neurosurgeon? Longer than I care to count. Um, I think close to 14 years, um, if you count six years of, um, of med school, um, six years as the core sort of neurosurgery training program. And then of course we have internship in between um, that, um, you have your first couple of years of being a junior doctor. And then even after you finish your core neurosurgery training, you go for um, you know, a couple of years, um, you know, anywhere between one to two years, sometimes even a bit longer, to do your subspecialty training um, as a fellowship, usually overseas. Wow. wow. And, and so, yeah, where did you do your fellowship? I did my fellowship in the UK. Um, so I did my, uh, my core fellowship in the UK, um, but I also took some time off um, at the end of that to do quite a few different observerships um, and sort of shorter training um, all around Europe. Mm. Um, and did you have any standout teachers or mentors along the way? I do. Um, very fortunate. Um, I have Cindy Malloy. Um, she's recently retired. Well, I say recent, but it's been a couple of years now. Um, and she's really, um, you know, championed my my career just from the get go. I've been really fortunate to have her, um, you know, look over me in a way and advise me and guided me throughout my whole career. But it's also being able to see her um, there as as a female as um, a and you know, being able to juggle life um, as well as her career um, at the same time, and um, also just seeing things from a slightly different perspective um, in terms of um, how to manage uh, patients and what she brings into her um, in your surgery career from a female perspective. I think it's been incredible. Yeah, she's a lovely lady. Yeah. She is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> One of the first people I met when I started this job. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, what was your experience like training and working overseas? Um, I loved my fellowship time overseas. Um, there was pre-COVID, of course, so <laughs> I actually got to do um, you know, um, quite a bit of travel. So I did it in the UK. Um, 
and I used it very much as a gateway to um, do quite a few different sort of workshops, meetings, um, like I said, short sort of um, uh, observerships all around different centers within within Europe because it's so um, connected and everything's really close. Um, it really makes me feel how, um, it makes you really notice how isolated we are in Australia. Um, you know, small population anyway, but also, you know, we're quite isolated in terms of the teaching, but also that community community, that neurosurgical community. So I really enjoyed that aspect of it and I learned a lot. Um, but also seeing how neurosurgery can be done so differently. Um, you know, the management of patients, seeing the um, variety, but also seeing the different um, technological aspects of it because we're such a small specialty and very new specialty. And a lot of what we do is becoming more and more reliant on new and upcoming um, technologies, um, all these new developments in, you know, how we approach our operations, um, how we navigate to you know, critical structures of the brain, um, it becomes much, much, much more safer. Um, so it's really nice to be able to be exposed to all of that while I was in Europe. Um, and when did you re relocate to Adelaide? Or what when? To Adelaide? Um, back to Adelaide in 2018, um, towards the end of 2018. Um, is when I started um, back here in Adelaide um, and I started my training here in Adelaide so um, my plan was always to come back um, so yeah um, and what are your particular subspecialties in neurosurgery? So I'm a paediatric neurosurgeon which is a subspecialty of, um, of neurosurgery um, and my other um, subspecialty is uh, minimally invasive neurosurgery so um, I did a lot of um, endoscopic work, um, crossocranial endoscopic work while I was um, overseas and yeah so that's what I plan to hopefully um, build up a lot more here in Adelaide. Now, I know you touched on it earlier, mm -hmm. but can you give us an example of a day in your life? Um, a day in my life? Um, so, uh, usually most days um, start at about 7, 7.30. Um, we start with, um, with a ward round or a meeting. Um, and um, and then it either is um, involving a clinic, um, either at the children's here at the Memorial Hospital or um, over at the Royal Adelaide. Um, and we also have obviously surgical lists as well. Um, most days I don't finish until probably about 6, 6.30. Um, it's a good day. Um, sometimes even a bit later, operating days tend to last, um, you know, tend to go on for much later. Um, and uh, I work six, six days a week. Um, on a Saturday, it's usually a shorter day. Um, we do a ward run at the children's hospital, a meeting with the craniofacial unit, which I always really enjoy. Um, and we usually finish about 10, 30, 11 on a Saturday. So that's pretty much it. And then when you're on call, you can have the best plans. And if something comes up that needs your urgent attention, then somehow you just have to make things work <laughs> and attend to the emergency. So what's the most hours you've worked in one week? 70 hours. What's the longest you've ever gone without sleep? Oh, um, this one's easy. Close to 72 hours, because I remember I fell asleep chopping vegetables on Christmas Eve, cooking dinner. <laughs> what was your first surgery on a real patient? Um, it was at Flinders, um, and it was for a bleed on the surface of the brain, and um, Dr. Nick Bodos was my consultant. <laughs> What is the longest surgery you've ever performed? Um, it would be not too long ago, um, 16 hours. And what was the surgery? It was an operation on, the, uh, on a benign meningioma deep um, on the brain. What is the most surgeries you've ever performed in one day? Six operations, um, spinal surgeries. What is the most common surgery? Would have to be a simple spine operation, like a laminectomy or a microsectomy. And what is the most complex surgery you have performed? Um, it would have to be when I was on fellowship, we did an endoscopic um, resection of a very big tumour within the ventricles. So it was through a teeny tiny hole. Uh, which do you prefer, tea or coffee? Oh, coffee 100%. <laughs> prefer that savoury or sweet? Savoury. What's your favourite sport and team? <laughs> What is one of the standout memories of your career so far? As a consultant, I think it has to be. Um, it was 
in late 2020, we did the first selective dorsal rhizotomy surgery for um, children with um, cerebral palsy at the Children's Hospital. And it was in the middle of COVID. Um, and we did it in partnership with Seattle Children's. So initially, the plan was that the team from Seattle Children's Hospital was going to come to Adelaide and do a, men do a proctorship um, for our first couple of operations. Obviously, COVID, they couldn't travel, things changed. And, you know, we came up with this idea well, why don't we try doing it via uh, MS Teams or via, um, you know, telehealth? And so that involved a lot of planning um, from the IT side. Um, but also, you know, logistically from um, from from the uh, from both hospitals, and we made it work, and the kid had a great outcome. And since then, we've done four other cases. Um, yeah, so that was just you know, I love how the, we had to think outside um, uh, the the box, and we made it happen and use technology to um, you know, to, to deliver uh, our patient care. Oh, great, great. Um, and so, yeah, that sort of leads into what are the biggest challenges? The biggest challenges, I think, um, is that, I mean, from a, a technical point of view, we, different parts of the brain is just so unforgiving, but also we can do what we think is technically, you know, the perfect operation. And for one reason or another, patient wake, patients can wake up with, you know, um, just horrific complications and we trace back our steps and we can't sometimes work out what actually happens um, and you know it's if there was like a complication that you know exactly what happened then the idea for us as surgeons is that yes we can try and avoid that next time you know what to do but there are some some things with neurosurgery where you know you're operating on the brain you just cannot understand why complication may have happened without you know without you know being able to trace back your steps and know what went wrong um, mm -hmm. and i think that's you know that's quite heartbreaking mm -hmm. what advice would you give to students interested in pursuing neurosurgery i think go for it um, you know i have found it very rewarding yes it's a lot of hard work but so is any other career um, you know i think if your heart's in it and it's something that interests you and you enjoy it you know, start early, um, you know, uh, as a medical student, get the rotations in through, um, through neurosurgery. As an intern, as a resident, you know, try and get the, um, the rotations um, to work within the department and let um, the consultants um, know early that that's what interests you and we can help out in terms of getting you into theatre, seeing cases, doing, all the re doing the research that can help, um, you know, put you in a better position to for the application. Mm -hmm. So, so we've talked about your neurosurgical career, but what about neurosurgical research? Yes. Yeah. Tell us about your interest in... So in my your... interest in neurosurgery research, I think um, in Adelaide, we, what we, um, because it's such a small subspecialty, and there's only four pediatric neurosurgeons in Adelaide, um, my interest is in pediatric neurosurgery. Um, again, you know, neurosurgery is a very young specialty, and with all this new and upcoming technology sort of coming into our practice, uh, we really need to um, invest in research um, to be able to work out what we're doing and how we can um, help our patients best um, and whether those new technologies are actually you know, serving a purpose um, to improve our outcomes. So I'm interested in clinical research um, and I'm really trying to set up um, research in terms of endoscopic research in, um, in pediatrics, but also looking at what we commonly see um, as a problem in pediatric neurosurgery, which is you know, um, premature ch children born with um, intraventricular bleeding, so bleeding within the brain, how we can improve their outcomes um, and, um, the, uh, and the research surrounding that. And, and so you are actively involved in research at the moment? And what... At the moment, at Royal, I'm, I'm involved with the Neurological Brain Tumor Bank and we're looking to set up a pediatric brain tumor bank as well. Um, and uh, we're currently looking at um, starting a research on um, intraventricular hemorrhage in, in preterm babies. Mm -hmm. And um, you're involved in the NRF, the Neurosurgical Research Foundation, yeah. and tell yes. us a bit about that. So I am a board member, um, and I've been really interested um, to, you know, 
to learn as I go along, because I'm very much a very junior board member, as to the work of the NRF um, and um, all the different research that we support as well, um, the activities around that, but also more importantly, the, um, the awareness that the NRF raises um, with regards to um, brain conditions uh, for the general public and the support that they provide. August is Neurosurgery Awareness Month. Yes. Are there any aspects of neurosurgery that you wish there was more awareness around? Yes, I think that um, it's important for the general public to know that the most of the brain tumors that we diagnose are very treatable. Um, I think there's this common um, perception that as soon as you're diagnosed with a brain tumor, it's um, you know it's an awful diagnosis and it's a um, life-ending diagnosis. And yes, you know a minority of our brain tumors are very aggressive and very difficult to treat, but the majority of the tumors that we see are very manageable and very treatable. That's a very interesting fact. Thank you. Um, what do you do enjoy doing in your spare time? I love to travel. Um, specifically, I love to travel to Africa um, to go on safaris and I love wildlife photography. So that kind of like, you know, fits in together. Do you have any quirky or interesting facts about the brain or neurosurgery? Hmm. Um, I think I find it interesting to learn that the brain actually sees information or sees the world upside down. Um, so the information that comes in through the um, through your eyes is actually upside down and the brain interprets it right side up. So quirky fact part two. Quirky fact part two is not the human brain, but um, I've been told that koalas have smooth brains um, and that eucalyptus is neurotoxic. So there you go.